Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Three Keys to Digital Preservation, Management, Technology, and Content, which is sponsored by Roman and Littlefield. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations uh, provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you will see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, please click the buttons labeled Chat and Q&A in the upper right corner of the screen to activate the panels. The Q&A panel allows you to submit questions to our speakers. Um, we'll have a quick question and answer session sort of in the middle of the presentation, and then we'll take some time, time at the end to answer any remaining questions. So please do send in your questions throughout. If you experience any technical issues, you can use the chat panel to let me know, and I'll troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, we're using the hashtag ACRLChoice webinars during the event, so if you have another screen handy, shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered will receive a follow-up email with a link to the archived version. All right, our presenters today are Edward M. Corrado and Heather Moonlayson Sandy. Edward is a librarian and technologist. When he was at Binghamton University, he led the first implementation of the Rosetta Digital Preservation System at a North American university. He is currently an associate professor librarian at the University of Alabama. Heather is an assistant professor at the iSchool at the University of Missouri. Her research focuses on the intersection of the organization of information and digital information technologies. With the long-term access to materials emerging as a natural combination of the two. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to you, Edward. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Edward, and in this webinar, Heather and I will cover the basics of digital preservation, uh, starting with what it is and a little bit about what it is not. Uh, we'll then consider three overarching and interrelated concerns in digital preservation. Uh, they are management technology and the content trying to be preserved itself. And then we'll conclude by considering some things you can do to prepare if you don't already have a digital preservation system in place at your library. So uh, that's kind of our agenda. And uh, so starting with what is uh, digital preservation, I'm sure uh, in this webinar that we have uh, at least an idea of what digital preservation is or you wouldn't have uh, you know, signed up for it. However, I think uh, that when I talk to different people, and this is particularly true of IT people, that the concept is not clear to everyone and people are coming at it from different angles. So even if we think we're clear what we're saying when we're saying digital preservation, other people don't necessarily uh, have that same concept or definition. For example, backups are not digital preservation, although I hear that from IT people from uh, on occasion. One definition that Heather and I like is from the Library of Congress's digitalpreservation.gov uh, website. It says that digital preservation is the active management of digital content over time to ensure ongoing access. I find that with some technologists uh, really do not pay enough attention to that ongoing management and the ongoing access needs of digital preservation. As uh, Wilson wrote, it's not possible to leave the digital object alone and expect it to survive, so we have to keep on uh, maintaining it over time. We need to actively manage uh, our digital content if we really want to ensure a future access. So one of the things that we were wondering uh, with people signing up for this webinar is where are you now? So we prepared a quick uh, survey here 
to see where everyone is with digital preservation. Uh, so where is your library and other organization in terms of digital preservation? If you could uh, fill out this poll uh, very quickly, we can get an idea of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Mark, can you tell us the results of the poll? Absolutely. Um, we're just closing it out right now. It should be all in in about seven more seconds. Um, and then I will share that out with everybody so that we can all see it. All right. There we go. So it looks like um, most people, or the largest percentage, have answered uh, D that we are beginning to investigate digital preservation um, with uh, sort of close in second and third place. We're not doing anything related to digital preservation and we're in the process of implementing a digital preservation program. Each of those comes in at 21 and 18 percent of respondents while um, we're beginning to investigate digital preservation comes in at 38 percent. All right. Uh, thanks, Mark. That's kind of what I expected uh, from this audience. So I think we've probably uh, hopefully geared our presentation correctly, but I should say that we hope that whether you have an established digital preservation program or if you're just starting or, or aren't doing anything and are just looking for more information, we're hoping that this uh, webinar will be useful to you. So I mentioned in the beginning that there are three key aspects of digital preser preservation that Heather and I identified in our digital preservation book. The three are management aspects, technical aspects, and content aspects. As you can tell from this image on the screen that they are, uh, the three aspects are interconnected and uh, really information specialists need to consider all three. We use a triad here to convey the interconnected nature of these three aspects since none of them is a standalone kind of consideration. They all work together. We will discuss each of these three in turn, but it's important to remember as we continue that digital preservation is complicated, multifaceted, and, and Many digital preservation activities will not fit neatly into one, only one of these aspects. They may fit into two or even all three of these aspects. And they'll also influence the other aspects. Management is at the top of this illustration because without management in the form of resources and policies, there are no impetus to preserve digital objects. In fact, uh, we'll discuss uh, management first. Uh, as I said, management is the first key to digital preservation. We've gotten a skeleton key here to remind ourselves that management unlocks a number of doors, so to speak. It's a pretty universal terms of uh, digital preservation initiatives. The way that we envision digital preservation, just about everything that goes on is related to management activities. Aspects of management definitely focus on the top to bottom project management needs of conceptualization and running a digital preservation initiative. However, these needs include planning for the technology aspects and the content aspects, the other two keys that we have identified. Uh, and this is as a way of making sure that uh, all the diverse aspects of the initiative are able to work together successfully. Practically speaking, management requires the creation of policies and documentation, as well as oversight of resource issues, including human resources and financial resources and, and technical resources. In the next few slides, we will discuss planning and policies, meeting organization goals, advocating for resources, and touch a bit on uh, personnel for digital preservation. Implementing and maintaining a sustainable digital preservation program requires the development of an institutional approach to digital preservation and establishing a policy of commitment to long-term maintenance of digital objects and collections. Policies are high-level documents reflecting the mission of the overall institution. According, accordingly, 
They are fundamental to making good decisions. More specifically, though, policies guide in the creation of action plans or guidelines on best practices for an organization. Plans, unlike policies, are more directly actionable and can be uh, case or even collection specific when you're talking about digital preservation. Plans can be seen as roadmaps that take into account the constraints of the institution. Plans are usually not voted on or approved at a high level of the organization and are often very specific in nature. Digital preservation issues are usually headquartered within a unit. For example, a library that is within a larger organization such as a university. In order to help ensure sustainability, it's important that digital preservation initiatives and their policies align with the overall organization's goals and missions. In order to receive future funding for their work, digital preservationists need to be able to convince management and other decision makers that digital preservation is important to the overall mission of the organization and not just an experimental uh, technology project. As Clive uh, Billinis described it, digital preservation is a long-term project, so service provisions uh, must also be long-term. In other words, we need a long-term commitment from administration. It is necessary to have that commi uh, commitment uh, for effective long-term preservation uh, because we need that ongoing funding and ongoing resources. Uh, and so the best way that a digital preservationist or maybe a university librarian can ensure a long-term commitment from upper management is to align the goals of the digital preservation initiative to that of the organization as a whole. Resources don't grow on trees and competition for support is increasingly uh, fierce across co college campuses and even within libraries. As Michael Lesk reports, uh, in a 1993 uh, British Library Strategic Review noted that the library did both access and preservation, access for today's users and preservation for tomorrow's users. Only today's users, however, help pay the bills. A preservation plan must balance priorities over time. I think this is still true today, whether we're talking about physical collections or digital collections or uh, physical preservation or digital preservation. Uh, we have to understand that, you know, it, digital preservation is a long-term need and uh, sometimes we can't really make a great case for funding there and it's, or it's very difficult. Um, I would say I think while it's on, while this has been changing recently, it has not been uncommon in the past for digitization and digital preservation to be funded on soft money. This is also pretty problematic. While it is often uh, easier said than done, digital preservationists need to advocate for long-term digital preservation and demonstrate the value. Uh, of it to administration to ensure sustainable funding and a success of a long-term project that has no end such as digital preservation or at least no end in sight. Heather Mulezan Sandy, who's my co-presenter uh, today and co-author of the, the book, and uh, her colleague Felicity Dykus conducted a survey of open DOAR repository administrators in the United States. For those that don't know, uh, OpenDOAR is a directory of online, freely accessible digital reposit repositories. For example, institutional repositories that are organized by content and by geographic location. The repository lists weren't necessarily digital preservation systems, but the study is still interesting for digital preservationists because, as we'll see later, much of the metadata we need for preservation is also what's needed for storage, retrieval, and use in a repository. Heather and Felicity found that an educated repository staff was key to support and access. Basically, we need highly skilled and knowledgeable staff to provide the best access, to decide on the most appropriate policies, to implement the best technology, and to manage different kinds of content successfully. We suspect uh, that this is true of digital repository staff in general, and it's also true of digital preservationists. 
who maintain uh, digital preservation systems that are in place or are going to be put into place. At this time, we can take a quick break for a question or two if anyone has any uh, questions about what we have covered so far. I see one question on who is storing digital preservation objects but don't have an actual digital preservation or management program. Uh, that's uh, an interesting question being asked. I think uh, a lot of places are probably in that predicament or, or that situation. And at the end of the uh, presentation, we actually will cover some issues that you can do to help make sure that uh, you're able to uh, maybe kind of plan for a digital preservation system if you're in that situation. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time, so why don't I, oh, wait, here comes one. Uh, what staffing levels and positions would be recommended for getting started? Uh, a lot of this will really depend on the scope, the size and scope of what you need. Uh, I remember seeing some studies where people had three or four people working on it. I will tell you, in my experience at Binghamton University, I think would be a good uh, idea of what we did. We had one person from a technology standpoint that spent maybe 50% of his time being a project manager and managing the technology, that was me. Uh, we had two metadata librarians that, that spent a portion of their time working on coming up with metadata schemas, uh, training staff from other departments that had content that they wanted to preserve. For example, we had a professor that had a large set of documents related to a serum collection. His graduate students actually did the cataloging and the metadata part of that. So we had those two people. Uh, the head of technical services spent some of her time on it as well. And also, we had a web services library that worked on the interface. So altogether, we had really five people that were really involved, but probably overall between those five people, it was about two FTE. Uh, some, uh, one other question before we move on. I see someone's asking about slides. I'm sure we'll make them available. Uh, and I see one about what materials are best suited for digitization. I think to some degree, my opinion, and maybe Heather has a different opinion, it really will be organization specific. Uh, but I think what we really want to look at in that, that question, to answer that question, is what is the risk reward uh, of that? So it's, it's kind of hard to answer that. But I would say you want to look at materials at risk, such as, say, real to real tapes, but also you want to look at uh, materials that are. Uh, of use to your community, which might mean like photographs or uh, textual type documents or letters in your archives, uh, which, you know, if someone kept on handling them, that would damage them and also people from remotes can't do that. So I really think you need to look at, uh, you know, it, it's institutional specific, but I think uh, most people have started with things like photographs and I've been moving more to audio. I'm seeing a little less in video, although that's starting to uh, pick up. Uh, at this time, I think that's enough questions for now. We'll have time for questions uh, at the end. So I think I'll hand it over to Heather at this time and she can get moving on and talking about technology. Sounds good. Thank you, Edward. Um, and I will just mention there is one question that's just so easily answered, and that's from Anna. Uh, she's asking if there's a Canadian uh, equivalent to Open Door, if there are Canadian participants. And yes, there are participants from the Open Door. That was the O P E N, all caps D O A R, um, the Directory of Online, uh, whatever it was, repositories. Anyway, they do have uh, participants from around the world, which is which is pretty neat. So um, moving on here to our second technology, uh, second key to digital preservation, which is technology. Um, 
and okay, so we're, it's a little tongue in cheek here, the, the image that we're using, because of course, anything that can fit in your pocket is not an acceptable medium for carrying out digital preservation. Just to be 100% clear, um, so this USB key is just, it's just a metaphor for technology. It's not an endorsement um, because of course, USB keys really should not be used to back up anything um, that, well, you know, that you really, really wanna be able to get to again. So in talking about technology, um, it was the luck of the draw. I ended up getting the largest section, uh, the largest key, if you will, of the three keys that Edward and I are discussing today. So we will actually be spending quite a bit of time in this technology section right now. Um, it, it's just because we were, we were kind of hoping that the, uh, that folks who attended this webinar would sort of have your profile. So this is good. We were trying to sort of aim towards people who were just getting started or looking to get started especially. So we're going to cover a broad range of technologies and things that you'll want to keep in mind. And we're certainly not trying to answer particular questions. So more give you food for thought uh, about directions in which you can go or things that you'll want to look into further. So, um, Specifically, we'll be talking about sort of big picture ideas surrounding the systems or the, the platforms that are used in digital preservation. Uh, I'll also speak sort of briefly to the idea of files and file formats that might be stored uh, in those systems. And then last but not least, a little bit about metadata and specifically a little bit about preservation metadata, but also kind of cool new stuff that's going on that just couldn't help but talk about. Um, so diving right in, the first bit, again, um, of this huge section of stuff is to talk about preservation systems. Um, a number of considerations go into thinking about digital preservation systems in use. So here I wanted to look at these three elements in particular. The first one is a model for thinking about digital preservation systems in particular, and it does other stuff too. <laughs> um, and then the, the next one here, the DCC curation lifecycle model is a model for thinking about this whole process, uh, which is obviously also important. It seemed like a good place to insert it right here. Um, and then at the very end, I'll go through some digital preservation systems that are available, just you know, a few uh, that are out there that, to give you some ideas of things that you might be tempted to investigate further. And digital preservation systems, and by this, we're talking about software platforms. Um, and and I, I specify because systems can certainly mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. They have to go beyond simple storage and access. Uh, they need to be able to future-proof the content, so the, the files that are being stored um, in future technology environments, not just in today's environment in order to promote future use as well as today's use. So this is an amazingly tall order when you start to wrap your brain around it. Um, and you know, that's what Edward was talking about earlier with all of the policies and planning and aligning with your uh, organizational goals and, and um, organization's objectives. So clearly all of this has to go beyond just having backups of today's files available in a system for retrieval tomorrow because that's not going to be sufficient. Um, so, you know, I guess the next question we ask ourselves is how did digital preservation even begin to conceptualize this, much less you know, to implement it? So the one approach is this open archival information system, OAIS reference model. Um, and I feel like, frankly, no presentation on digital preservation would be complete without mentioning this. And I know that some of you, especially those of you who have systems in place, are going to be probably incredibly familiar with this model, and others probably not so much. Um, either way, though, we felt it was important to talk about it sort of as a, a point of reference, if nothing else, for thinking about digital preservation uh, initiatives and then the software that's going to support them. So OAIS, it's, um, it's a mature standard, it's a recommended practice, and I'm doing air quotes here, but you can't see me. Um, and it's, it's a magenta book. Um, it was first developed by the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, and so space, as in like outer space. Um, and it's become formalized since then, and it's actually available also. The identical thing is available as an ISO standard. Um, the thing about the ISO standard is that it costs money to access, and this one is available for free online, the OAIS Magenta version that I'm showing you here. Um, 
So as a result, I think you'll find that most people tend to refer to the uh, CCSDS version of this, the, the one that I'm showing you the cover to right here. And so apropos to this whole name thing, from the ISO website, we're reminded of the following. So the open in this, uh, in this OAIS, this Open Archival Information System, um, is, is used to imply that the standard is open, not necessarily that access to the archive is unrestricted. So just to be clear, you don't have to, um, you can have a dark archive and still apply um, and still have it be OAIS compliant. So the, this reference model, it does a whole lot of things, which is really great. And it's, you know, it's super to have something like this available to us. So one thing that it does that sort of goes under the radar, I think, that, that is interesting to mention nonetheless, is that it provides a common vocabulary. Because we do have, as you know, a number of different kinds of information professionals who are working on digital preservation uh, initiatives. So we have people from archives, we have people from museum studies, we have people from libraries, we have people from beyond those realms as well. And of course, we all in each of our professions might have different terminology that we're going to use, different jargon. So one of the things that the OAS, OAIS reference model does is it helps harmonize the language that we're using so that we don't have to do what I just did in the beginning of this and explain what is meant by system. Um, we all have a shared understanding because we're using the same terminology. So you'll, you will see this in places, just to, you know, clue you into this. You will see words that are written with a capital letter that otherwise probably should not be normally. And it may be, in fact, that those are terms that have been uh, glossed in the OAIS reference model. And so that would mean that they're being used in a very particular way. So you would want to pull up the reference model and look it up in the glossary to make sure that you understand exactly what the meaning is in that context. Um, so I guess one other thing to point out is that this is a reference model. It's not a blueprint for what a system, for example, has to look like. So it, it's not instructions on how to build a system even. It's just an idea of notions that need to be considered in your digital preservation initiative. So I think that's sort of a, a theme, right? We don't have all the answers, but we have lots of ways to, to think about the problems. And eventually that will, um, lead you to come to conclusions that are adapted to your situation. So this is the OAIS reference models, functional entities. And I, I encourage you to look this over as I'm talking and then probably, you know, look it up on your own if you're still curious about what's going on here. So this model is a rep representation of what an OAIS should look like. And again, it's not a blueprint, but it's a schematic and it's outlining these different stakeholders and processes that are going to be necessary in a digital preservation initiative. Um, and just, you know, for the record, a lot of digital preservation systems are going to say that they're OAIS compliant, meaning that they follow this schematic and, and meet all of these objectives. Um, so they, that would mean, in other words, that they, these systems that claim to be OIS compliant have found ways to implement these ideas in practice. So that might be something you would be on the lookout for. Uh, just to walk you through this, you'll notice on the left-hand side, there's the producer of content. Uh, and on the right-hand side, there's the consumer of content. Um, in the middle, there's this whole management business. <laughs> this is, of course, where your digital preservationist is, is going to come in um, as, a, as a huge stakeholder and, and one that has the, the knowledge and skills to be able to carry out all of these activities. Um, so right in the middle, we have things like preservation planning, data management, archival storage, creation of descriptive information, administrative of, uh, administration of the files, et cetera. Um, so, you know, if you want to go with me on this, a can, a reductionist version of this might sort of be the following. The content producer on the left submits content, and that's what that SIP thing is. That's the content being submitted. Um, and then it's going, this content is submitted into the archive, and then the file is ingested, right? So it's, um, it's accepted into the system, and then it's managed within the system, all these management activities that you see outlined here. And then the consumer on the right-hand side, um, you know, either at present or in the future, is going to be able to query the system and retrieve the digital content. It's going to be formatted in a way that's appropriate. That's that DIP business that's being um, that, that's being made available to the consumer on the end. 
So all of this, I mean, it makes it look kind of easy, which is great. Um, I guess, you know, obviously it's, it's the management bit in the middle that is where things get a little tricky. Um, but nonetheless, this is still, I think, a great way for us to think about the work of digital preservationists and the systems that uh, they're going to be working with. And the next slide that I have here for you is so this is a, the Digital Curation Center Curation Lifecycle Model, and this is going to help us think about the, the whole process that's going on here. So not just the technology ends of it um, and, and the stakeholders, but just sort of all of the management ideas that Edwards was talking about earlier, and of course that integrates with the technology. So I, I didn't want to go through this in, in super great detail, and I do acknowledge that this is not incredibly easy to read and, you know, depending on your eyesight and how far away the screen is, maybe impossible to read, but this might be something that you would be tempted to look up later on. So this is another one of those things that felt like, oh, if we're doing a presentation on digital preservation, we probably ought to throw this in. Um, I will mention before moving on that you might be sitting there thinking to yourself, wait a minute, we were supposed to be talking about digital preservation in this webinar, and this model says curation instead. So I did want to take this opportunity to point out that preservation and curation um, may be terms that you find used interchangeably, or you may find that they have very specific meanings, um, that curation might claim to be more of the, the entire thought processes that go into digital preservation, whereas digital preservation is normally just um, could be conceived of as simply uh, the application of technology to solving uh, long-term access problems. But the way we see it and the way we're presenting it, um, we're presenting digital preservation as a, as a all-encompassing sort of uh, initiative, and so it includes all of the things that we mentioned in the beginning there, management, as well as the technology, and then Edward will talk about the content in just a minute. So this is another way of conceptualizing things. Now, I promised you we'd talk about some systems. I um, won't spend a lot of time on these. I just wanted to, you know, give you some names, things to look into. So just to kick things off, the first one is Jira Spaces Jira Cloud. So Jira Space is a not-for-profit organization, and it provides leadership and innovation for open technologies that promote durable, persistent access to digital data. So there you go. Um, and one of their projects is actually called Jira Cloud. Um, so that's the platform, and so that might be something, depending on your interest in open access, um, it might be something uh, that appeals to you. Lots of people are using it, as you can see. Archivematica is another one that we can talk about, also open source, and uh, preservation system. Its development is headed by Artifactual Systems, and it's based out of Canada. Um, so it's also designed to conform to OAIS, and hosting is available if that's important to you. Um, and I just mentioned a few systems, uh, metadata schema with which it's compatible, um, just because I wanted to, you know, get you excited about the bit about metadata that's coming up. So hang on to your hats. Um, the last one that I'll just mention by name here, um, and again, we're pretty sure that any you know, vendor that you talk to will be happy to recommend one. So we're not recommending, we're just showing you what might be out there. LibNova's LibSafe. Um, so this one is this company is out of Spain, and it can be hosted in the cloud. So the whole point is to make you see quote unquote difficult tasks easy. Um, and it's pretty good at preserving any kind of file format. Um, it's also OAIS compatible, and even though they don't have a huge customer base in the U.S., they have a lot of installs in Europe, and so it might be something that you would want to look into. Um, so it's entirely possible that you're going to say that I just went too fast um, or that you're interested in looking some, at something other than the three that I mentioned. And um, I'd like to point out to you, you may not be familiar with this as well, but uh, there was an IMLS grant a several years back at this point, and the whole idea was to create um, this, this grid of different kinds of technology and resources that were available, and then to mention what it is that they were able to, to work with, the kinds of content um, that they were able to work with or systems that they were able to produce, and I'll show you what I mean in just a second. So there's a table that they built, um, this 
power grid, very clever name, preserving, and then digital, the D doesn't show up. P-O, pre preserving digital objects with restricted resources, that's the P-O-W-R-R, -R, power grid. Um, and you, you will find that, um, the, since the project is over, there's a, a new wiki that's begun and community members are contributing to it. So there's still quite a bit that's out there that's available and so it might not be entirely all brand new um, and, and completely 100% recent, but it's probably going to be good enough to get you at least started down the right path of looking further into a uh, technology resource if you think that you found one that might be worthwhile um, after looking at this grid. So here's the very tippy top of the of the Uber grid. Um, so this is the newer iteration of it. And this one first looks at technologies that are able to work with audio files in particular. And actually this, this whole thing lists out different kinds of files that might be um, preserved. And then you have to scroll down quite a way to get to the information about different platforms and, and systems for, that can be used for preservation. But across the top here, this is what I really wanted to capture, was information about access, annotation, discovery, redaction. Again, so then they list little check marks underneath each of these, um, under each of these items that we may find uh, the technology able to do for us. And so in a way across the top, all of these things that are listed here, it's sort of a laundry list of possibilities that we might want to pursue. Um, so there are things to keep in mind that you might not even realize systems were able to do. So that's the power grid. Um, turning now to the files themselves, um, trying to promote long-term access through files is you know, it's, it's a little bit trying to see the future, but that's okay. So here's another Michael Les quote. Um, Michael's great. Uh, he wrote that the greatest danger to digital materials is that we forget the meaning of them. Preservation depends on our knowledge. We must have, we may have the bits, but be unable to interpret them. So providing the bits is one thing, and it's something that our current technology can do pretty well, especially with proper planning and policies. But just having the bits is not enough for someone else to be able to use them. And an example that Edward and I like to point to is, say you wrote your thesis in the 1980s using the dominant word processor at the time, WordStar. Would you be able to access it today? Um, you know, probably not. Um, so there are a number of things to think about with files and file formats. One of those is compression. Uh, compression, sorry. Digital preservationists recommend uncompressed files, just for the record, um, because when you, um, if you, if you actually are going to compress your files and, and you're using uh, compression that is, um, you, you may end up losing parts of, of the file itself and, and be unable to restore them if, if lossy compression is, um, is an aspect of the file format that you've chosen. Um, so you, you, to avoid information loss, you might want to, that's something that you're going to want to look into. Um, another issue is storage. So there are lots of thoughts about how many copies are required. Many people believe you want three different copies in diverse geographic locations. Some people will argue for two. Um, as with anything else, most people say that it depends on your institution and your needs. Um, we feel that if your budget allows, more is better, but um, you know, more is, more is also more to maintain and take care of. And then one other thing just to bring up about files is that you can't just put your files on a virtual shelf and forget about them. Uh, one of the things that can affect your files is bit rot. And you, you don't want the ones to flip to zeros or vice versa because when that happens, your file can end up being unreadable in the long term. Um, so one way to discover bit rot is to perform fixity checks and that's going to be a mathematical formula that is used to create a checksum for a file. And then we can compare it to previous checksums. If the, if the current checksum is the same as the previous one, then you know you're okay. Um, and if not, there's been some sort of change to the file that otherwise might be imperceptible, but you'll wanna restore your file from that backup that you had um, in order to ensure its integrity over the long term. And in terms of which file types are best, um, same as before, I know I'm starting to sound like a broken record, there's no one-size-fits-all 
solution to this. Um, but that being said, there are definitely some characteristics that you're going to want to look for when you're creating or managing files um, because the nature of file formats is um, we like to go with ones in general that are open, so open access or uh, a published standard. Probably it's going to be maintained by a standard organization such as ISO. Um, and that way it can be used and implemented by anybody. And then another thing that you're going to want to look at is you're going to want to see if the file type is widely used. Um, because if you have good community support, that means there are people that you can turn to for help. Um, so ultimately deciding what file format and at what level, uh, these are management decisions. So we're back to what Edward was talking about earlier, right? Um, so there are lots of um, lots of resources for helping you figure this out. The Library of Congress has some fabulous um, materials available for you. And being cognizant of time, well, I just have to say this. All right, so metadata. I teach I teach a class called Digital Libraries, and last night my students had their um, presentations, and one woman said, "This is a library student." She said, well, we all know how important metadata is to uh, accessing materials, for example, on the web, that the web doesn't work without metadata. And, you know, nothing makes my heart sing like a student who says something like that. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Metadata is necessary for everything that we do in the digital realm, but it's also uh, no surprise required for digital preservation. So everything that we're doing to support storage and access and retrieval of documents or resources or files under quote unquote, normal circumstances, all of that is going to be required for digital preservation. But we get some extra fun stuff that works, uh, that's specifically designed to support digital preservation. In particular, I'm talking about PREMISE. Uh, PREMISE uh, stands for Preservation Metadata Implementation Strategies. It's now in version 3.0. Um, and it was Released in 2015, latest update was November uh, of the year. It's freely available online. So this is um, a metadata schema that intends to address issues that other metadata schemas are not going to be able to, that are going to affect uh, preservation and future use. So that's the importance of having premise. Um, I guess we could mention, though, that it. So it's, it's recommended because there's nothing else that does what premise is meant to do. But however, it, inclusion might not always be completely straightforward and definitely it has a reputation for being uh, labor intensive to supply premise uh, metadata to, um, to contents in that whole, remember back to the OAIS reference model, functional entities. So it's applying that as part of the management process. Uh, it can be, be deemed to be somewhat labor intensive. I think systems are getting better at uh, making premise usable. Um, but just to let you know, it, it, um, it's definitely something to think about. And there's this great new book that just came out. Um, and we're really not getting, you know, any sort of kickback at all for plugging it. But it might be something for you to look into uh, if you do find yourself using premise. Um, and so it's got a, a bunch of really great people who were involved in editing it. Um, so I would think that that would be a good resource for you to know about if that's something that you're going to find yourself doing. And finally, we get to write statement. And this is just gratuitous. It's not completely preservation metadata at all, but I just felt like it was really important to say because uh, I just feel like it's so neat what's going on. So DPLA and Europeana came together to uh, launch this whole rights statement. Um, and I actually spelled it incorrectly there, apologies. It's rightspluralstatement.org. It's spelled correctly in the title of the slide. So the whole thing came about as a response to this uh, white paper from 2015. And it proposes 11 standardized rights statements for online cultural heritage that are human and machine readable. So, you know, if you've worked in special collections or archives, you can probably relate to the desire to have standardized rights statements for an organization. Um, but then this, you know, it's not just within the organization, it's also being used by um, entities like DPLA, which makes it really, really neat. So it is time for me to hand this back over, I think, to Edward. I didn't see uh, too many questions come in. Um, the only one that I saw that came in, 
since I've been talking is proprietary technologies and then the, the questioner asks about a specific repository. And I'm pretty sure that this is the sort of thing that might be answered by looking into the, the power grid and see what's available for manipulating uh, files, for example, into the future and also thinking about the OAIS compliance, the, the kinds of management tasks that are deemed to be required for making content available in the future. Um, and, oh, I do see one final question here before I hand it off to Edward. Uh, premise addresses issues that other databases can't. So I, I think the questioner means premise addresses issues that other metadata schema can't. So things that have to do with um, updating files, for example, normalizing them, um, because you want to make sure that you are promoting uh, authenticity and, and that you're keeping track of things like provenance. And of course, there, um, there are schemas that allow us to keep track of things like provenance, but um, they allow us, Premisa is designed to support preservation in ways that others are not. Other schema tend to be designed to help support um, storage and retrieval and access and use. So with that, Edward, uh, my questions are done. I will hand things back over to you. Sure. All right, thanks, Heather. Uh, the third key that we have is content. Uh, we already talked about management technology, but really without content, there's nothing to preserve, so there's no reason for any technology or any management. Uh, without content, uh, as I said, you know, why have a digital preservation initiative? The type of content being preserved, though, can affect the technology needed in the management decisions. For example, while there are some overlaps, the technology needed to preserve an interactive multiplayer game is a lot different than the technology uh, needed to preserve a photograph or an academic paper, or electronic thesis, or dissertation. The management decisions about resources and policies would also, of course, be affected by this. As we said uh, earlier, management technology and content are all interconnected. Uh, when possible, it's really important or at least helpful to get content creators and owners on board as early in the digital preservation pro process as practical. They created the content, so they're often better equipped at describing the content, and if they're involved well enough, they can create the necessary metadata for you, the descriptive metadata in a way that is easy for your digital preservation system to ingest and make use of. They can also maybe choose file formats that are more preservation friendly. Of course, there are also experts in their discipline and at least in theory know how the content will likely be used in the future. And it is reasonable to assume that there will also be users of that content that they deposit and uh, similar content. Can. So really try to work with your creators and your digital content owners however possible. And you also really need to think about your users. Uh, there's no reason to preserve digital content or any content for that matter if no one's going to use it. The use in some cases, though, of course, may be years down the road, and it may be hard to predict how content will be utilized in the future. However, uh, current and future use needs need to be considered. Digital preservationists need to consider what do users expect when interacting with digital objects in, that you are preserving? Do they expect to be able to just retrieve the file? Or say in the case of an interactive game or a research simulation, do they actually expect the digital preservation system to provide a mechanism to actually play and interact with that file? Or do they expect to just do that on their own computer using their own technology? Uh, there are much different technology and management uh, decisions would be needed for this latter uh, situation. Another question is how are they going to be able to discover and access any files? What are, is the appropriate descriptive metadata that enables users to discover files over time? Uh, most digital preservation systems until recently really focused on things like photographs and scans of uh, documents such as letters or even books. Uh, this is starting to change, especially with, uh, we're seeing a lot more with audio and some with video uh, and some with some other specialty formats. But each of these formats has their own issue uh, moving forward, their own issues. There's the basic preserve the files, but then how do you actually provide long-term access, what, make sure that the files are readable uh, down the road? And I just wanted to point out a couple 
uh, different types of specialty content that you might want to consider how you're going to preserve. The first one I wanted to touch about is websites. With the recent election of the new president of the U.S. and him uh, taking office in January, the preservation of previous of the previous administration's websites has been big news, at least in the library and digital preservation world. Web content, including web pages, uh, videos, and blogs, I mean, includes all sorts of different formats, and it's really somewhat imperial. Uh, so, but yeah, it can be extremely useful for researchers, especially social science research, uh, researchers. The process of harvesting and storing websites is often referred to as web archive, and archiving websites can be more difficult than it may first appear because uh, many of them are not static pages. They're generated by underlying databases and other technology that the people attempting to archive the website might not have ready access to. The content may also change frequently. Think about your Facebook page uh, wall, how quickly that can update if you have a lot of people that you interact with Facebook. And of course, they include all different types of files such as audio and video, and that's not even getting to, into intellectual property issues. Luckily, uh, there are groups that are working on this. Probably the most familiar is Internet Archive and its way back machine. Uh, but the Internet Archive is a large-scale ambitious project that's looking at archiving as much of the web as possible. There are also smaller and more focused projects as well. While there is open source software available to archive websites, it's a complicated process and it can be complicated to operate that software. Therefore, many institutions look to partner with the archive, uh, Internet Archive and its Archive It service. Archive It enables you to capture, manage, and search collections of a web-based digital content without te uh, the technical expertise or hosting facilities. And as a bonus, it's, the archive websites can be made available in the Wayback Machines. Uh, so libraries and other organizations, especially those without extensive technical expertise and resources, would probably want to look at a service such as Archive It or, similarly, sir, uh, or a similar service such as the Internet Memory Research's Archive the Net platform. Uh, I'd also wanted to mention uh, 3D files, because uh, they're kind of interesting. They can be more of a static 3D image file, but they can be quite large. And the situation right now is that there's not a lot of uh, huge standards on how to uh, on file formats. A lot of these things are using different file formats. Uh, so they can be quite complex, and also they can be uh, quite large. I know someone from Germany that's working on preserving uh, 3D scans of the inside and the outsides of cathedrals, for example, so you can imagine how large those files. But there are some file formats to take a, a look at, including OpenGEX and X3D. One thing to really notice here, though, is that gaming applications are leading the way, not digital preservation. Where's Digital preservation is a small little slot in this ecosystem of file formats and, and everything. So we really don't uh, have the clout to really push things forward. So we really need to look at what's going on in other areas, such as I said, uh, gaming platforms and things like that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's just not enough uh, weight that we can move forward. Uh, I want to talk real briefly some of the things that you can do uh, for digital preservation if you don't really have a, uh, a system yet. We really didn't write the book as a getting started or a how-to guide, but more of an overview of all the issues that I really wanted to know about when I was implementing a digital preservation system and Heather wanted to know about. So we really based it on kind of what we really wish we wanted to know from everything from theory and stuff, but not really a how-to uh, guide. And I think there are various things that you can consider. First of all is educate yourself, go to webinars such as this one, workshops, read books. I can recommend a book for you, and we recommended that premise book by another author. The other thing is to identify content, uh, create a, a digital asset repository that is what the Digital Preservation Coalition, which is based out of the UK, suggests. And then you can kind of organize your digital content, uh, make copies of your digital content. As we mentioned, you should uh, make those contents uh, and store them in different places if at all possible. Uh, 
also maybe do a risk uh, manage, well, one, manage your content over time. You can't just save your files once. You have to make sure that you can read them down the road. So if you don't have a digital preservation system and the ability to do fixity and check some file uh, comparisons to make sure there, there wasn't bit, bit broad, at least try to open the files and make sure that you can read them maybe once a year or so. Uh, the other thing I really wanted to make sure to mention is documentation. I have the documentation as a separate bullet point here, but this is really not something you do at the end, of the end or only at once. You really need to do ongoing documentation of your digital preservation project. Uh, you know, digital preservation is for an indefinite time period. It's unlikely you'll still be here when people are trying to figure out when you do it, at, you know, still working at that same institution. And even if you are, uh, you know, a few years or a few months down the road even, you might not remember why you made different uh, decisions. I know I certainly wouldn't. Uh, so in summary, in many ways, digital preservation is a new frontier in access that is both exciting and often. Digital preservation allows information professionals to preserve for the long-term content that otherwise, if not cared for, would unquestionably be lost. We have all had experiences where digital content uh, that we wanted to save for personal reasons has been unretrievable. This captured for many reasons. An email was accidentally deleted. A specific digital photo from a vacation cannot be adequately uh, distinguished because all the file names are identical. Uh, the DVD got jammed in the machine and broke, a hard drive crashed, et cetera. It's heartbreaking when personal digital content is lost, but put it in perspective though against uh, a personal item that is not serious being lost and a carefully curated digital artifact as part of a unique collection of interest to a designated group of stakeholders and researchers uh, is lost. And two, institutions really just simply cannot risk the loss of digital content over time, and digital preservationists must systematically take steps to collect, organize, maintain, and provide appropriate access to digital objects in a way that is both rational, responsible, and well-documented. Digital preservationists need to accept that they can't preserve everything, however. They need to have content-related policies, such as collection development policies that provide guidance in selecting what to preserve. Uh, as we, you know, as we mentioned, we identified three kind of aspects of digital preservation that we, are, we feel are key, management, technology, and content. These key areas are interconnected and influence each other greatly. We cannot preserve in a digital preservation system if there's no content. Likewise, in order to have sound digital preservation systems, we need to understand and respect the technology and the practices and standards of the information and cultural heritage communities we are working with. Finally, there will be no one to uh, collect and organize content if there is no overarching context in which to work. That of the digital preservation initiative that is rigorously thought out Manage, documented by information professionals with specialized knowledge, experience, and skills. While technology and content are obviously extremely important, I think it is important to understand that in many ways for many different types of content, we have a good idea how to preserve much of the digital content we are likely to encounter in libraries. There are good and best practices for traditional digital objects such as photographs, images, and text, and such practices are being developed for other types of content as well. However, digital preservation is a long-term endeavor, requires resources, be them technical, human, or financial, and also requires appropriate planning and policies in order to be successful. In this way, digital preservation perhaps is primarily a management exercise. Uh, thank you, everyone. And, uh, I saw we have some time for some questions, and I noticed some questions about different systems. And I think Heather kind of answered this before, but since there is multiple questions I saw talking about either individual systems or what the difference between, say, a digital asset management system in an institutional repository system and a digital preservation system is. Uh, Certainly a digital asset management system could include the functionality of a digital preservation system and vice versa, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that a digital asset management system is the same as a digital preservation system or a digital library system is a digital preservation system. Uh, digital preservation systems provide 
that preservation component of making sure that you're checking file fixity, making sure that you're managing your file formats and that you know exactly what kind of file formats you have and how you're going to read them. And if you need to migrate them or normalize them to new file formats over time. So it's the whole management part of that over the long term where a digital asset management system is more looking at a short term frame and might not include all those aspects. In a digital library system, while again, a digital library system could include digital preservation, uh, on the face of it, it's more about providing access than providing preservation. I don't know, Heather, uh, if you saw any other questions worth uh, looking at. No, I mean, there are lots of good questions, but I, I respect people's time and it is time. So, um, I mean, I think we'd be happy to answer questions if folks wanted to email us and because we love to talk about this stuff and sometimes we end up just talking to ourselves. So if we could include another person in our conversation, that would be very cool. Um, but so I guess I guess I'm I'm ready to thank everyone for coming. Great, thank you. This is Mark from ACRL and Choice. Um, we will uh, send around a a follow up email tomorrow morning probably, um, and um, we can talk about um, whether you would like to um, address any other questions or anything in that. Um, but for now, I will say thank you so much, uh, Edward, and thank you so much, Heather, for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I think it's been a very, very good session. Um, I think there's a lot of information here, a lot to take in. So um, we will uh, make sure to post the recording as soon as we've got it. And I'll remind our, review, our viewers today that we did record the program, and we will send out a follow-up email um, with a link to the recording. Thank you everyone who's on the line listening today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session and I hope the rest of your day is great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone and definitely don't be uh, shy and email any questions that you have that we didn't get to. Yeah.